Welcome to our 73rd episode of Two Tankers in a Kit. We're your host, I'm Charlie. And this is Russell. Well, Russell, I think uh, good old Vladimir Putin uh, saw that his people, uh, even his uh, just regular man on the street, was like, nope. And uh, he's backing off of uh, around Ukraine, which is awesome. Oh, yeah. But uh, we'll talk more about that at the end of the podcast. You know, everybody seems to enjoy the fact that we are getting straight in instead of doing everything at the front. So let's jump into a tank that is way overdue for an episode. Yeah, we're going to talk about the Panzer Kampfwagen 4 or the PZ.KPFW.4, commonly known as the Panzer IV. It was a German medium tank developed in the late 1930s, and it was used extensively during the Second World War. Its ordnance inventory designation was the SD.KFZ.161. The Panzer IV was the most numerous German tank and the second most numerous German fully tracked armored fighting vehicle of the Second World War. 8,553 Panzer IVs of all versions were built during World War II, only exceeded by the Stug III assault gun with 10,086 vehicles. Its chassis was also used as the base for many other fighting vehicles, including the Sturm IV assault gun, the Jagdpanzer IV tank destroyer, the Wind self-propelled anti-aircraft gun, and the Brombar self-propelled gun. The Panzer IV saw service in all combat theaters involving Germany and was the only German tank to remain in continuous production throughout the war. It was originally designed for infantry support, while the similar Panzer III was to fight armored fighting vehicles. However, as the Germans faced the formidable T-34, the Panzer IV had more development potential with a larger turret ring to mount more powerful guns, so the two switched roles. It received various upgrades and design modifications intended to counter new threats, extending its service life. Generally, these involved increasing the armor protection or upgrading the weapons, Although during the past months of the war, with Germany's pressing need for rapid replacement of losses, design changes also included simplifications to speed up the manufacturing process. The Panzer IV was partially succeeded by the Panzer Medium tank, which was introduced to counter the Soviet T-34, although it continued to be a significant component of German armored formations to the end of the war. It was the most widely exported tank in German service, with around 300 sold to Finland, Romania, Spain, and Bulgaria. After the war, Syria procured Panzer IVs from France and Czechoslovakia, which saw combat in the 1967 Six-Day War. You know, and this isn't funny, but it just strikes me funny. Actually, it's just so weird. Can you imagine being a World War II Holocaust survivor and then, you know, being resettled in Israel— and now you're an Israeli tank commander, and you're looking through your sights, and all of a sudden, here comes a Panzer IV from Germany. Wow. It, it yeah. pops up right in the sights. You know, no wonder Syria lost all those tanks. Very true. The Panzer IV was the brainchild of the German general and innovative armored warfare theorist, Heinz Guderian. In concept, it was intended to be a support tank for use against enemy anti-tank guns and fortifications. Ideally, each tank battalion in a Panzer division was to have three medium companies of Panzer III's and one heavy company of Panzer IV's. On January 11, 1934, the German Army wrote the specifications for a medium tractor and issued them to a number of defense companies to support the Panzer III, which would be armed with a 37 millimeter or 1.46 inch anti-tank gun. The new vehicle would have a short barreled howitzer like 75 millimeter or 2.95 inch as its main gun and was allotted a weight limit of 24 tons. Development was carried out under the name Biglet Wagon accompanying vehicle or BW to disguise its actual purpose given that Germany was still theoretically bound by the Treaty of Versailles ban on tanks. Mann, Krupp, and Rheinmetall Borsig each developed prototypes, with Krupp's being selected for further development. The chassis 
had originally been designed with a six-wheeled interleaved road wheel suspension, as already adopted for German half-tracks, but the German army amended this to a torsion bar system, permitting greater vertical deflection of the road wheels. This was intended to improve performance and crew comfort both on and off-road. However, due to the urgent requirement for the new tank, neither proposal was adopted, and Krupp instead equipped it with a simple leaf spring double bogey suspension with eight rubber-rimmed road wheels per side. The prototype had a crew of five. The hull contained the engine bay to the rear with the driver and radio operator, who doubled as the hull machine gunner, seated at the front left and front right respectively. In the turret, the tank commander sat behind his roof hatch while the gunner was situated to the left of the gun breech and the loader to the right. The torque shaft ran from the rear engine to the transmission box in the front hull between the driver and radio operator. To keep the shaft clear of the rotary base junction, which provided electrical power to the turret, including the motor to turn it, the turret was offset 66.5 millimeters to the left of the chassis center line, and the engine was moved 152.4 millimeters to the right. Due to the asymmetric layout, the right side of the tank contained the bulk of its stowage volume, which was taken up by ready-use ammunition lockers. German engineering. It's so strange that at the beginning of the war, you know, General Heinz Kadarian is sitting down and looking at the tank forces that he would be facing. And remember, we're talking about like those little Russian BT-7s and stuff like that, you know, really kind of, you know, junk tanks. I I shouldn't say that because they were really well done, but, you know, He's like, man, my Panzer threes are going to come in with their, uh, you know, guns and they're going to be fast and they're going to smash right through these Russian little tanks and anything that the British have, you know, they, you know, we're, we're just going to smash right through them. Yeah. Cause you know, the, the goal was always the Soviet Union, you know, everybody says, no, the goal was England. Nah, no, it wasn't. So when you think about that, you know, he starts out with these Panzer threes and then he says, well, we're going to run into, you know, anti, you know, anti tank, you know, fortifications and, you know, just, you know, general bunker type areas. And then we're going to have to have the Panzer fours, the support tank to come up there and blow them out with the bigger guns. But, uh, then the Soviet T-34 shows up and those roles got reversed real quick. The first mass-produced version of the Panzer IV was the Ossoff A, meaning Variant A, in 1936. It was powered by a Maybach HL-108TR, producing 183.87 kilowatts, and used the SGR-75 transmission with five forward gears and one reverse gear, achieving a maximum road speed of 31 kilometers per hour, or 19.26 miles per hour. As main armament, the vehicle mounted the short-barreled, howitzer-like 75mm tank gun, which was a low-velocity weapon mainly designed to fire high-explosive shells. Against armored targets firing armor-piercing shells at 430 meters per second, the KWK-37 could penetrate 43 millimeters or 1.69 inches, inclined at 30 degrees at ranges up to 700 meters or 2,300 feet. And the 7.92 millimeter MG-34 machine gun was mounted coaxially with the main weapon in the turret, while a second machine gun of the same type was mounted in the front plate of the hull. The main gun and coaxial machine gun were sighted with a term Zeifler Nor 5B optic, while the hull machine gun was sighted with a Kugel Zeifler Nor 2 optic. The Ossoff A was protected by 14.5 millimeters or 0.57 inches of steel armor on the front plate of the chassis and 20 millimeters or 0.79 inches on the turret. This was only capable of stopping artillery fragments, small arms fire, and light anti-tank projectiles. A total of 35 A versions were produced. In 1937, production moved to the Ossoff B. Improvements included the replacement of the original engine, the more powerful 220.65 kilowatt Maybach HL 120TR engine and the transmission with the new SSG 75 transmission with six forward gears and one reverse gear. Despite a weight increase to 16 
tons. This improved the tank speed to 42 kilometers per hour or 26.10 miles per hour. The glacius plate was augmented to a maximum thickness of 30 millimeters or 1.18 inches, while a new driver's visor was installed on the straightened hull front plate, and the hull mounted machine gun was replaced by a covered pistol port and visor flap. The superstructure width and ammunition stowage were reduced to save weight. A new commander's cupola was introduced, which was adopted from the Panzer III Ossif C. A smoke grenade discharger rack was mounted on the rear of the hull starting in July 1938 and was backfitted to earlier Ossif A and Ossif B chassis starting in August 1938. 42 Panzer IV Ossif Bs were manufactured. You know, what a workhorse. The fact that the Panzer IV was referred to as the workhorse of the German army uh, says a lot. Uh, people forget that Panzer IV was in the field at almost every major tank battle. Not all of them, of course, but most of them, they were at least, you know, there or close by. The Ossif C replaced the B in 1938. This saw the turret armor increase to 30 millimeters or 1.18 inches, which brought the tank's weight to 18.14 tons. After assembling 40 Ossif Cs, starting with chassis number 80341, the engine was replaced with the improved HL120 TRM. The last of the 140 Ossif Cs was produced in August of 1939. Production changed to the Ossif D, this variant of which 248 vehicles were produced, reintroduced the whole machine gun, and changed the turret's internal gun mantlet to a 35mm or 1.38 inches thick external mantlet. Again, protection was upgraded, this time by increasing side armor to 20 millimeters or 0.79 inches, as the German invasion of Poland in September 1939 came to an end. It was decided to scale up production of the Panzer IV, which was adopted for general use on September 27, 1939, as the SD.KFZ.161. In response to the difficulty of penetrating the thick armor of British infantry tanks, the Matilda and the Matilda II, during the Battle of France, the Germans had tested a 50 millimeter or 1.97 inch gun based on the 5 centimeter Pac-38 anti-tank gun on a Panzer IV Ossif D. However, with the rapid German victory in France, the original order of 80 tanks was canceled before they actually entered production. In October 1940, the Ossif E was introduced. This had 30 millimeters or 1.18 inches of armor on the bow plate, with a 30 millimeter or 1.8 inch applique steel plate was added to the glacis as an interim measure. A new driver's visor adopted from the Sturm III was installed on the whole front plate. A new commander's cupola adopted from the Panzer III Ossif G was relocated forward on the turret eliminating the bulge underneath the cupola. Older model Panzer IV tanks were retrofitted with these features when returned to the manufacturer for servicing. 206 Ossif E's were produced between October 1940 and April 1941. In April 1941, production of the Panzer IV Ossif F started. It featured a 50 millimeter or 1.97 inch single plate armor on the turret and hull, as opposed to the applique armor added to the Ossif E and a further increase in side armor to 30 millimeters or 1.18 inches. The main engine exhaust muffler was shortened, and a compact auxiliary generator muffler was mounted to its left. The weight of the vehicle was now 22.3 tons, which required a corresponding modification of track width from 380 to 400 millimeters to reduce ground pressure. The wider tracks also facilitated the fitting of track shoe ice sprags, and the rear idler wheel and front sprocket were modified. The designation Ossif F was changed in the meantime to the Ossif F1 after the distinct new model, the Ossif F2, appeared. A total of 471 Ossif F tanks were produced from April 1941 to March 1942. You see, the Panzer IV commanders are sending information back to the generals and the designers and engineers of what they're having problems with in the field. Uh, perfect example is, you know, they took out that uh, hole mounted 
a machine gun and put in a pistol port. Yeah, that's the one that really surprised me. That <laughs> Can you imagine the, the, the guy writing the report? Dear sirs, the idea of me sticking my hand out a pistol board <laughs> with a Luger 9mm pistol to shoot oncoming hordes of, you know, infantry is not a good idea. Man. You know, it sounds like, you know, he's writing, writing that uh, yeah, Christmas story. Remember when the kid's writing a uh, letter to his teacher asking for a Red Ryder BB gun? <laughs> I think a Red Ryder machine gun is way better than a football <laughs> pistol. You know? Oh, I forgot. This is going to be on released on, what, January 4th? Yeah. This is so January 4th new, episode. Happy, yeah. Happy new, happy new Year to Happy everybody. New Year, yeah. We made it another year, guys. It's been rough, but we've made it. Yeah, it's been rough. <laughs> Poor Russ is. Didn't you get a, a, a call out near your house or something where the guy fired like 30 rounds or something? Oh, yeah. I think it was at least 60 rounds at uh, three or four guys in a car drove by and shot up a house, a front of a house. And that was only about a block, about a half a block behind me. Yeah. So it, it was, I was just getting up for work. I go to work early in the morning and yeah, I was getting ready for work and heard all the shots and I thought, whoa, what the crap's going on? It's, but yeah, this, this little town of about 12,000 people, it's, it's pretty rough anymore. It really stinks that the dope's taken over. That's, that's what's going on. It's all drug related, but hey. And, and, and that's what I keep trying to tell people that everybody says, oh, it's a small town. Uh, yeah. Dude. 60 rounds in a drive-by in any one of those rounds could have yeah hit your house and yeah. hit you know yeah. lightning or you yeah or, i know that's all it would have taken it's crazy nobody but, was um, nobody was hurt in this one thank goodness but it, it's i don't know it, it's getting bad yeah, it is it's flat out war in some of these towns man if you're shooting 60 rounds yeah. in some boy's house it's war yeah exactly but anyway, to get back to what we were talking about, you know, we keep jumping off the topic. You know, these commanders are getting the information and, and they're going back to the designers. And, and you can see with all the different variants and when they're bringing the old ones in, they're changing it. And, you know, they're like, OK, the pistol port was a bad idea. Well, we got, we're, we need more armor because they're throwing grenades at it and this and that. And they're listening. Uh, tell us, uh, you know, keep going on about this, Russell, about the different variants. Yeah, the Ossif F2 to the Ossif J. Talk about that a little bit. On May 26, 1941, mere weeks before Operation Barbarossa, during a conference with Hitler, it was decided to improve the Panzer IV's main armament. Krupp was awarded the contract to integrate the 50 millimeter Pack 38 L-60 gun into the turret. The first prototype was to be delivered by November 15, 1941. Within months, the shock of encountering the Soviet T-34 medium and KV-1 heavy tanks necessitated a new, much more powerful tank gun. In November 1941, the decision to upgun the Panzer IV to the 50mm gun was dropped, and instead Krupp was contracted in a joint development to modify Rheinmetall's pending 75mm anti-tank gun design later known as the 75 centimeter Pack 40 L-46. Now, to cut in real quick, can you imagine how quick those those tank commanders were screaming for something to pin these Oh, KB yeah, guns yeah. And, and these T-34s. They're, they're out there with this little Pop 50 and, and you know, 50 millimeter, which is uh, honestly a very good gun. And, and they were hit, making hits, you know, they were doing, you know, the correct things and they were making you know uh hits on target but they were just bouncing off man and they were like uh help so the next thing you know they're like oh, oh wait a minute we got these 75s Let, let's let's put that in because the recoil length was too great for the tank's turret the recoil mechanism and chamber were actually shortened this resulted in the 75 millimeter kwk 40 l slash 43 when the new KWK-40 was loaded with the armor-piercing shell, the new gun fired the AP shell at some 750 meters per second, a substantial 74% increase over the howitzer-like KWK-37. Initially, the KWK-40 gun was mounted with a single-chamber, 
ball-shaped muzzle brake, which provided just under 50% of the recoil system's braking ability, firing the Panzer Granate 39, KWK 40 could penetrate 77 millimeters of steel armor at a range of 1,830 meters. The longer 7.5 centimeter guns were a mixed blessing, and in spite of the designer's effort to conserve weight, the new weapon made the vehicle nose heavy to such an extent that the forward suspension springs were under constant compression. This resulted in the tank tending to sway even when no steering was being applied, an effect compounded by the introduction of the Ossif H in March of 1943. They cut in again. Uh, they're like, okay, we've got to have something, you know, we've got to have a gun that'll kill these things. And these engineers are like, uh, you want us to put that gun in this little tank? It reminds me of the, the story of uh, the Sherman Fireflies, where they got the 17 pounders and they had to like turn it on its side just to get it to <laughs> drop in. So here's these poor designers like, listen, the, the gun's going to be so heavy as you're going down the road, it's going to go right and left, right, left, even if you're not, you know, controlling it. The Ossif F tanks that received the new longer KWK-40 gun were temporarily named the Ossif F-2. The tank increased in weight to 23.6 tons. Differences between the Ossif F-1 and the Ossif F-2 were mainly associated with the change in armament, including an altered gun manlet. Interval travel lock for the main weapon, a new gun cradle, a new term Zeifler Nor 5F optic for the L-43 weapon. Three months after beginning production, the Panzer IV Ossif F-2 was renamed the Ossif G. That's incredible. Uh, they're like, oh, we got this new gun. And you know the uh, the tank commanders were sending information back to the engineers like, hey, this is a great gun. You know, it's a little heavy, but uh, it shoots farther than we can see. So they had to put new optics in all of them. During its production run from March 1942 to June 1943, the Panzer IV Ossif G went through further modifications, including another armor upgrade, which consisted of a 30 millimeter or 1.18 inch face hardened applique steel plate welded or later bolted to the glacis. In total, frontal armor was now 80 millimeters or 3.15 inches thick. This decision to increase frontal armor was favorably received, according to troop reports on November 8, 1942, despite technical problems of the driving system due to added weight. At this point, it was decided that 50% of Panzer IV production would be fitted with 30 millimeter thick additional armor plates. On January 5, 1943, Hitler decided that all Panzer IVs should have 80 millimeter frontal armor. To simplify production, the vision ports on either side of the turret and the loader's forward vision port in the turret front were removed, while a rack for two spare road wheels was installed on the track guard on the left side of the hull. Complementing this, brackets for seven spare track lengths were added to the glacis plate. For operation in high temperatures, the engine's ventilation was improved by creating slits over the engine deck to the rear of the chassis and cold weather performance was boosted by adding a device to heat the engine's coolant, as well as a starter fluid injector. A new light replaced the original headlight, and the signal port on the turret was removed. In March 1943, the first Panzer IV with excursion skirts on its sides and turret was exhibited. The double hatch for the commander's cupola was replaced by a single round hatch from the very late model Ossif G, and the cupola was up armored from 50 millimeters to 95 millimeters. In April 1943, the KWK 40 L-43 was replaced by the longer 75 millimeter gun with a redesigned multi-baffle muzzle brake with improved recoil efficiency. The longer L-48 resulted in the introduction of the Termizal Fornor 5F-1 optic. So it's obvious that the German generals love the Panzer IV. You know, they keep sending it back and back to get these upgrades. They were active in getting their tank commanders recommendations on improvements and getting battle reports from the field and taking all this data to the engineers and the people in charge. 
you know, uh, you said in there that the, that the troops were happy with the improved armor, even though it, it made, you know, the driving a little bit more difficult. They were like, hey, you know what, we'll get it down the road. Just give us some armor and, and a better gun. Because, you know, they had hordes of these T-34 tanks and these KV-1s coming at them. I'd be the first person to say, hey, listen, yeah. give me a gun that can penetrate them and, and give me some armor where I, I, I can survive. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's just incredible. I mean, what are we up to? Like the OS of G- H now or whatever, or G? Yeah, the OS of G. And holy cow, they just kept adding armor yeah. on each one of these versions. It's like, yeah, you, you've got to, to counteract what the crap's shooting at you. So we went all the way up to G. Uh, tell us about the next version. The next version, the Ossif H, began production in June 1943 and received the designation the SD.KFZ.161-2. The integrity of the Glacius armor was improved by manufacturing it as a single 80 millimeter plate. A reinforced final drive with higher gear ratios was introduced to prevent adhesion of magnetic anti-tank mines, which the Germans feared would be used in large numbers by the Allies. Zimmerant paste was added to all the vertical surfaces of the tank's armor. The turret roof was reinforced from 10 millimeters to 16 millimeters and 25 millimeter segments. The vehicle side and turret were further protected by the addition of 5 millimeter hull skirts and 8 millimeter turret skirts. This resulted in the elimination of the vision ports located on the whole side as the skirts obstructed their view. During the Ossif H's production run, its rubber-tired return rollers were replaced with cast steel, a lighter cast front sprocket, and rear idler wheel gradually replaced the previous components. The hull was fitted with triangular supports for the easily damaged side skirts. These modifications meant that the tank's weight increased to 25 tons, in spite of a new six-speed SSG-77 transmission adopted from the Panzer III, top speed dropped to as low as 16 kilometers per hour or 10 miles per hour on cross-country terrain. An experimental version of the Ossif H was fitted with a hydrostatic transmission, but that was actually not put into production. Despite addressing the mobility problems introduced by the previous model, the final production version of the Panzer IV, the Ossif J, was considered a retrograde from the Ossif H, born of necessity to replace heavy losses. It was greatly simplified to speed production. The electric generator that powered the tank's turret traverse was removed, so the turret had to be rotated manually. The turret traversing mechanism was modified and fitted with a second gear, which made hand operation easier when the vehicle was on sloping terrain. On reasonably level ground, Hand operation at 4 seconds to traverse to 12.5 degrees and 29.5 seconds to traverse to 120 degrees was achieved. The resulting space was later used for the installation of an auxiliary 200 liter fuel tank. Road range was thereby increased to 320 kilometers or 200 miles. The remaining pistol and vision ports on the turret side hatches were removed and the engine's radiator housing was simplified by changing the slanted slats to straight slats. Three sockets with screw threads for mounting a two-ton jib boom crane were welded on the turret roof while the whole roof was thickened from 11 millimeters to 16 millimeters. In addition, the cylindrical muffler was replaced by two flame-suppressing mufflers. In June 1944, while Proof 6 had decided that because bomb damage at Panzer Firma, Krupp, in Essen, had seriously jeopardized tank production. All plates which had been Face hardened for the Panzer IV were instead made with rolled homogeneous armor plate. By late 1944, Zimmerit was no longer being applied to German armored vehicles, and the Panzer IV side skirts had been replaced by wire mesh, while the gunner's forward vision port in the turret front was eliminated, and the number of return rollers was reduced from 4 to 3 to further speed up production. This failed and confirmed that the chassis had reached the limit of its adaptability in both weight and available volume. The things that you're talking about, you can tell at that point Germany was really losing the war. Yeah. They had they had to change from rubber to cast iron wheels because, you know, rubber was tight. 
they had to remove, uh, you know, side skirts and stuff like that yeah. because metal was tight. And everything was and, being rushed because all their factories was being bombed and and not as much production. I mean, it's just, yeah. You know, everybody's screaming for tanks and they're literally like, we, we've got to get faster. We've got to do this. Let's take off the electric motor and give it a hand crank. Well, you're losing a lot of the stuff that made the Panzer IV what it was. So the later models were kind of rush jobs. Everybody's like, oh, they were way better tanks. Well, no, because they were missing, you know, simple things like an electronic turret, uh, rubber wheels. But they finally got to a point where the engineers were like, hey, listen, we can't put a bigger gun on this. We can't put a, you know, better transmission. We can't get a better engine. This is the best this tank can be. And the other, you know? the other big thing I'm seeing too is it, it's kind of like some of the other tanks that Germany produced. Bigger and heavier is better. Right. And I think that kind of ended things too with the Panzer IV because they were trying to put too much into it. Yeah. Putting too much steel on one chassis, it didn't work. <laughs> I mean, it, to a point it worked, yes, but, but there's only so much you can put, so much steel that you can actually weld to a dang chassis and it's, and without making it too heavy to go. Now, have you ever seen one of these up close? I no, not in person. Well, it, no. it, it, it's not a big tank. Yeah. And, and, and they're trying to turn it into a King Tiger. Yeah. That's what I'm, yeah. That's what I was getting at now with, with Germany's bigger and heavier is, is the shit. You know, if they had of maybe stopped the King Tiger production, you know, regearing factories to build these things and concentrated on the Panzer IVs, I don't know. I don't think the outcome would have changed. No. It would be a totally different war. Yeah, I agree. The Panzer IV was originally intended to be used only on a limited scale. So initially, Krupp was its sole manufacturing prior to the Polish campaign. Only 217 of these Panzer IVs uh, were are produced. Um, in 1941, an average of 39 tanks per month were being built, and this all of a sudden rose to 83 tanks per month in 1942. You know, and that kept going up. In 1943, they had 252, and in 1944, they had 300. But, you know, like they were saying, in December of 1943, Krupp's factory was diverted to manufacture the Stug 4. And let's be honest, they went to the Stug 4 for the simple fact that it was really easy to produce. It was just, you know, same gun and, uh, you know, same hull. They just weren't putting on the turret and, you know, the uh, electric motor to turn the turret and stuff like that. They were just putting a gun on on there and putting a superstructure on top of the hull and saying, push it out the front. In the spring of 1944, the factory began producing the Jag Panzer IV, leaving only one plant uh, still assembling Panzer IVs. With the slow collapse of the German industry under pressure from Allied air and ground offensives, uh, in uh, October 1944, that factory was severely damaged during a bombing raid. By March and April 1945, production had fallen to around 55 tanks per month, you know, that were coming off the assembly line. By the end, like you'd said, they built 8,553 of all these different variants. Here's the courage, you know, even if it's misplaced, the courage of the guys in the factory. Their factory was bombed. And they're still out there and they know they've got to get these tanks out. And these guys are working as hard as they can. And they're kicking 55 tanks out a month, even though they've been bombed. Russell, there's so many variants. Uh, and, and I want to get into the stats, but why don't you just give me the Panzer IV, like the H model? Give us a specification on the H. The mass of this tank was 25 tons. The length was 5.92 meters or 19 foot 5 inches long. The width was 2.88 meters or 9 foot 5 inches wide. The height was 2.68 meters or 8 foot 10 inches high. Had a crew of 5, which included the commander, the gunner, a loader, 
a driver, a radio operator, slash bow machine gunner. The armor, the armor included a whole front armor of 80 millimeters, or 3.1 inches thick. The whole side, upper and lower armor was 30 millimeters thick, or 1.2 inches. The whole rear, upper and lower, was 20 millimeters thick, or so or 0.79 inches. The whole roof and floor armor was 10 millimeters thick. The turret front was 50 millimeters thick. The side, turret side and rear armor was 30 millimeters thick. The turret roof was 10 millimeters thick. So you had armor anywhere from 50 millimeters or two inches thick at the turret front all the way down to the turret roof at 0.39 inches or 10 millimeters thick. So... The main armament was a 7.5 centimeter or 2.95 inch KWK 40 L slash 48 main gun. And they usually carried about 87 rounds of that ammunition with them. And that's another thing we didn't address is the fact that, you know, when they were changing these guns, you know, they'd have to go in and gut all the ammo racks and everything to get bigger rounds and bigger rounds and the whole just it, where it was to where it finally ended up. Between each, That's a but, big, yeah. Between each that, variant, it, it took some engineering. I mean, it wasn't just slamming this stuff in there and, and making do. It. Yeah, it, it was. Yeah. And you know the commanders and generals were saying, hey, we need as many rounds as we can. Yeah. To get 87 rounds of that 7.5 centimeter uh, gun in, in that little tank, that, that's that's amazing. It is. The secondary armament consisted of two 7.92 millimeter MG-34 machine guns. They carried about 3,150 rounds of ammunition for those. We haven't even discussed that. I know. You, you know, you got two machine guns and you got to load up 3,000 rounds on top of your 87 tank rounds. Yeah. Man, I bet that, I bet it was really tight in there. Yeah, it had to have been. The engine was the Maybach HL120 TRM 12 cylinder gasoline engine. It cranked out about 296 horsepower or 220 kilowatts. The power to weight ratio was 12 PS or 8.8 kilowatts per ton. The transmission had six forward gears and one reverse gear. Suspension consisted of the leaf spring. The fuel capacity was 470 to 670 liters, or 120 to 180 U.S. gallons. The operational range was 200 to 320 kilometers, or 120 to 200 miles. And the maximum speed was 42 kilometers per hour, or 26 miles per hour. Yeah, because the later models, you know, they started piling all that stuff on, and it made it really heavy, and it dropped it, like you said, down yeah. to like 16. That that's oh, just man. A it big is, target. Yeah. So I mean, some Russian farm boy using you know horsehair sights, yeah, they're gonna hit that thing. We're gonna go ahead. And, man, we're running late on time too. But uh, let's go ahead and try, talk about this second point because I want to talk about it. It was the last big battle that Germany won. Now there's some debate on you know oh well there was other battles they won, but the last big battle. Uh, that Germany won is what Russ is going to start talking about here in a second. But uh, this battle, the German plan, basically, they saw that the first Ukrainian army and the Polish uh, army was pushing in towards Berlin. And they were, you know, basically going to pincer the Ninth Army that stuck there. You know, they were kind of trapped. So we're going to be talking about how the Germans fought against the Polish and some of the Ukrainian units and, uh, well, some of the Soviet units to uh, try and save it and break through to the ninth and, and uh, the reasons behind this battle and why they fought so desperately. The Battle of Botzen in April 1945 was one of the last battles of the Eastern Front during World War II. It was fought on the extreme southern flank of the spremberg torgau offensive, seeing days of pitched Street fighting between forces of the Polish 2nd Army under elements of the Soviet 52nd Army and 5th Guards Army on one side and elements of German Army Group Center in the form of the remnants of the 4th Panzer and 17th Armies on the other. The battle took place during the first Ukrainian front's push towards Berlin, which was part of the larger Soviet Berlin offensive. 
The battle was fought in the town of Botson, and the rural areas to the northeast situated primarily along the botson Nyski line. Major combat began on April 21, 1945, and continued until April 26, although isolated engagements continued to take place until April 30th. The Polish 2nd Army suffered heavy losses, but with the aid of Soviet reinforcements, prevented the German forces from breaking through to their rear. After the battle, both sides claimed victory, and modern views as to who won the battle remain contradictory. Because the war was almost over, and the battle had no strategic impact on the ongoing Battle of Berlin, German historiography has focused more on its tactical aspects. The German operation successfully recaptured Botzen and its surroundings, which were held until the end of the war. In the last months of World War II, the Polish 2nd Army took part in the Soviet drive on Berlin, along with part of the 1st Ukrainian Front. The Poles operated in the center of the front, flanked on the right by the 5th Guards Army, and on the left by the 7th Mechanized Corps. Opposing these forces was the 4th Panzer Army under Army Group Center. On April 17th, the Polish 2nd Army breached German defenses on the rivers Weiser and Neisse. Their pursuit of retreating German forces toward Dresden threatened to cut off additional forces in the Muscara Forest region. On April 18th and 19th, elements of the 2nd Army engaged the Germans in the south and pushed them back while remaining units drove on to Dresden, gaining bridgeheads on the River Spree north of Bosden and destroying German forces in the Muscar Forest. The following day, Soviet units of the 7th Mechanized Corps captured parts of Botzden and secured the line south of Nyski, taking Weinberg and trapping several German formations. The Germans decided to prioritize the taking of Dresden over securing their southern flank. They planned to launch a counteroffensive at the southern flank of the Polish army. Their aim was to stop the 1st Ukrainian Front's advance and break through to Berlin to relieve the trapped 9th German army. The Germans were pinning their hopes on the ideas that the Soviets might be fended off long enough for the city to be surrendered to the Western Allies. So what what we're looking at is that you've got the 4th Panzer and the 17th Army. You know, a lot of people say, well, no, that was the uh, German Army Group Center. The Army Group Center was shattered. They were in total defeat. Okay, this is the best that they could scrape together is one, you know, uh, you know, or two, you, you know, they were shattered. So they got together with the 4th Panzer Army and the 17th Army and said, hey, listen, we've got to try and help the 9th hold Berlin until they can at least let the allies, you know, America, France, uh, UK, and all the other allies to capture Berlin and let it not fall into Russian hands. Now, we know that uh, Roosevelt and Churchill have both said, uh, no, no, the Soviets want Berlin, and this is kind of a revenge thing for them. So they kind of just weren't going to take it anyway. In fact, when they agreed, you know, reached the uh, banks, you know, or the borders to Berlin, that they stopped. But the units involved, like I was talking, was Germany's 4th Panzer Army and the 17th Army, the Polish's 2nd uh, Army, and the Soviet Union's 5th Guard and 52nd Army. Uh, the German strength was like 50,000 troops and 300 tanks, 600 ar artillery pieces, and 497 armored vehicles. The Polish army had 90,000 troops and 500 tanks. The Soviets that were backing them up it were at least 20,000. So you got about 110,000 tr combat-ready troops plus 500 tanks. So the Germans are really outgunned. You look at the casualties, the German casualties, they lost 6,500 guys. The Polish uh, lost 18,000 with 250 tanks lost. That's half their tanks, plus 18,000 dead in the field. And the Soviet casualties was around 7,000. You know, they didn't really keep track of, you know, their losses. You look at that, and there, there's 25,000 guys all gone and, and half their tanks. And the Germans, you know, lost 6,500. So tactically, or, you know, tactically, you know, looking at it, you know, the Germans won that fight. You know, they recaptured uh, 
Dresden and you know, it was all for naught anyway. It's sad, actually. Well, let's talk about something fun. Let's talk about tanks in the news. I was really surprised that, I mean, let's face it, uh, our president didn't have a Snapchat with uh, uh, Vladimir. And, and, and let's be honest, I don't think Vladimir's scared of Mr. Biden at all. But I think he looked over and saw that NATO was being serious. You know, the French... Uh, it, it are pretty firm, like, hey, listen, you're not going into Ukraine without having problems. And uh, even the British uh, have some train or military trainers uh, over there helping train some of these guys. And all of a sudden, these, you know, like we talked about last episode, these javelin missiles are showing up. I, I think he was looking around and saying, wait, wait a minute. You know, even countries like Portugal and and Spain and and these guys, they're saying, you better not do it. Maybe they wouldn't have got into a fight, but the economic costs would be huge. And and I think you would agree with me. uh, Russia's just not in a financial good place to begin a war. And, you know, I have quite a few friends in Russia uh, that are... um, in the military that are Facebook friends and stuff like that. And they're saying, Hey, listen, we love Putin, but we're not, we're not going to stand for, you know, just going in there as an invasion yeah. army. You know, uh, they got away with it in Crimea, uh, peninsula because they were like, Hey, these are Russian citizens and they're living there and they want to be part of Russia. So they kind of did that over there, you know, it's still a bad deal, but when you're, telling your people that you're going to move 125,000 of their, you know, sons and fathers and brothers into a country for an invasion, that's a it little is. bit different. I hate to say it, the the Russian people, and, and I shouldn't hate to say this, it's actually a great thing about the Russian people. They, they really don't like the word invasion. They remember yeah. World War II. They've, they've got all the monuments and memorials of you know the millions and i mean millions that died they're they're like no 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 no. we're not an invasion army we're a defensive army you know the germans invaded us we pushed them back you know we got our revenge you know but when you're talking about going into places where you know ukraine still has really close family ties with a lot of russian peoples and and when you're telling these russian people we're going to go in there and, and start you know an invasion, they're, they're like, we're not going to do this. So I, I think, I think it came close. I do think so. I, I agree 100%. But you know, me and Russell both prayed on this and, and we're just glad to see that Putin's like slowly, I, I think he withdrew 20,000. We'll just have to stay tuned on this one and, and hope for the yeah. best. But I, 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 I honestly don't think that the Russian people will yep. stand for it. And you were telling me we had a recording. Or somebody actually yeah, we want to give a call? huge shout out to Aiden Anderson. He uh, left a message. Hey, we ask you folks to to leave us a message on our speak pipe, and uh, you can get to that through our actual web page at two tankers and a cat dot com. And there's a link right there on the front. And, and Aiden left us a message. You'll have to check out what he's got to say here, and we'll let him do some talking. Hello, Two Tinkers and Cat. I love your podcast, and I am 10, which is pretty young, but I've been watching it since the second episode, and you guys should try a new game called War Thunder, and it's like World of Tanks, but a little bit different, but I love your podcast. Well, what a great message, and as far as War Thunder has, uh, yeah, I've played it. Let's be honest, you got to be a pretty smart cookie to you play do. War Thunder. <laughs> Yeah, I like World of Tanks. I just sit there and point and click and yep. shoot the tanks. It's more of arcade where War Thunder does have a lot more, I don't know, tactical history, stuff like that. It's just difficult yeah. for me. You know you're in trouble when a 10-year-old's <laughs> out there smarter, smarter than I am. Oh, boy. I can make a comment, but I will refrain this time, Charlie. Uh, uh, oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's my best friend, Russell, there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, what a great shout-out. Uh, we also wanted to uh, thank everybody, and we got tons 
uh, messages on Facebook and other where, you know, other places saying, you know, Merry Christmas, Happy yes. Holidays. Uh, it means what, a lot a to deal. us. Really does. It's been an incredible so, ride into another into yeah. another year. And yeah, man, man this is episode seventy three. Yes, I, I definitely want to get to episode one hundred. That'll be fun. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll now, be. I mean, neat. we've already knocked out seventy five. I how know. Many year, how many years have we been doing? Oh my this now? gosh! Is this well? This beer. Yeah. Was this our second year or third year? No, no. We. This is. See, I can't keep on. track. I can't keep track of the. People are going to yeah. be laughing at us. They're like, try working, guys, or try working twelve-hour shifts, folks, and you can't keep track of time. I promise. Better yet, you know, <laughs> and some of the complainers and stuff. Better yet, remember Russ's backdoor neighbor had sixty rounds dumped <laughs> into his house, and Russell's getting ready for work. Uh, hadn't even put on his gun yet. Man, sitting in there shaving, and then all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose and gunfire. Yeah. Don't try and tell everybody that you remain calm and you're like, hmm, I, I should go investigate that. First thing I did was uh, call the police. <laughs> yep. When you're sitting in front of the mirror, you know, shaving in your underwear, you just, you're like, I, I, I am not, I am not capable of yep. doing my duty right now. I want to give a shout out to our Patreons. Yeah. We'll start with uh, Jake Azaki. He's been back with us for a little bit now and. Thank you, Jake. Means a lot. And, uh, bless Kim and Eric Shearer. Yes. Means a lot, guys. No doubt. Antonio Bernarda and Alejandro Martinez. Still with us. Great guys. Yes. Uh, Bjorn Ben, uh, ODS Thero, and everybody's favorite, Rick Schmidt. Rick Schmidt. Well, you know, I, I'm friends with uh, Rick on uh, World of Tanks. And right now you can send Christmas presents, you know, or Christmas boxes to, you know, your friends. I've sent you some, but you haven't played. I know. Much. I haven't had time. I've I've also got another project coming up and I might speak of that later on, but we'll we'll see. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice. Save that for episode seventy four. Episode seventy four, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And uh so that's our Patreons. Again, um, we would like to expand our Patreons and uh, get you, the listener, to support the show. Yeah. Um, you know, most of you have been listening for, you know, 73 episodes yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And said, well, I don't want to donate because, you know, they don't feel like they're going to be around or they've taken breaks. We're going to be around. Yes, we're going to be around. We did have to take yes, a break. Yes, yes. You know, uh, it, it's not that we did it yeah. because, you yeah. know, we were angry at each no, other no. Or, or anything like that. It's the fact we're that here. Russell, Russell's de- job is down people. How many people are you down? I right don't now? know. We're supposed to have five per shift and we're right now we're at three if we're lucky wow. per shift. So, and we've got four different wow. shifts. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's crazy. But, but that's every police department in America yeah. right now. Yeah, it is. Nobody, w- nobody wants to do it. <laughs> and I, and there's, and, there's and a reason. Not bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Your, your pay is not bad. Hey, yeah. Go to ParsonsPD.com if you're interested in being a police officer. I'll, I'll make that shout out to you folks if you're out there listening. We're always hiring. I'll guarantee you. You, you know what? I used to be the chief of police. I'll yeah. write you a reference. Hey. And they are throwing money at us, so it's a, it's a good time to get into it. Well, I, I wouldn't say it's a good well, time to get into it. It, it, it'll, it'll, it'll calm down eventually. I'll guarantee you. It's, it has to. Yeah. Or, or this country's going to be oh, a civil war. Man. Uh, but anyway, um, I guess that brings us to the end of the show. Doesn't yeah, it? I believe so. Well, this is Charlie. And this is Russell. As always, happy tanking and have a great week. <laughs>